Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, participants are just joining the call and we'll get started in just a minute uh, as folks filter in. Thank you for being here today. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to get started in about one minute. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna start in one minute, just seeing the Zoom uh, folks trying to get in. All right. Good morning. Or good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Samantha Gordon, and I am Tech Equities uh, SVP for Programs, and I am thrilled to be with you all here today. Um, I'm really excited to get into this topic um, and have an opportunity to hear from four really amazing panelists, as well as um, hopefully State Senator uh, Monique Lamon will be joining us at uh, some point during the call today. Um, but before we really dive into the topic, I want to get started and just give a quick overview of Tech Equity, as well as the KPOR Center, who's a joint host of our event, um, and an opportunity for you to hear about what we do. Um, and I'll do a quick little bit of housekeeping. So Tech Equity, we engage tech workers to take action on building an economy where everyone benefits from the growth that tech has created. So we do that really in three main ways. One, we do education, like the event that you all are joining today. Thank you for being here. Uh, second is we do public policy. So we work in partnership with community groups to develop a set of public policy priorities to advance our mission. And third is we work on corporate practice. So we come up with um, corporate practice changes that would help advance the mission for companies who want to voluntarily make those changes and improve conditions for their employees and folks in the communities where their business operates. Our two main areas of focus are housing and labor. And I want to just pause here and thank our partner, um, the KPOR Center, for co-hosting co this event with us. Um, and they are a critical funder of our project, which we're talking about today, the Contract Worker Disparity Project. Um, the KPOR Center works to remove barriers to STEM education and tech careers for underrepresented people of color. And um, it is our research for this project would not have been the same without the KPOR Center and without their support. So if you don't know them, um, our my colleague uh, Herman is going to drop their organization's website in the chat. I would encourage you to check them out. They're fantastic. They put on great events. They do great work. Um, and thank you so much to the KPOR Center for helping make this event possible and make this project possible. Um, a couple quick things before we jump in. One, we keep our chat open. Um, we think that's a great thing to have in these events. And with that, uh, we have a code of conduct um, that basically says we want to create a safe space for learning. So please be respectful of your fellow attendees and their opinions. Um, and I think Herman's also dropping a link to the chat, uh, to that in the chat. There will be a lot of links. We'll also send a follow-up email. Um, and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the meeting. So if you have questions, go ahead and please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that by now, but if you drop it in the chat, we may miss it. Um, and then final two things, this session will be recorded and it will be shared in our follow-up email. So if you have to drop off or you wanna share the conversation with a friend, you'll be able to watch it on demand starting tomorrow. And finally, we are really uh, glad to be joined with an amazing ASL interpreter, Cress Garcia, who's joining us today and helping to make this conversation more accessible. So thank you to Cress uh, for being here. All right, 
So today, let's talk about why we're here. Uh, about a year ago, we launched the Contract Worker Disparity Project to shine light on the growing problem of inequality within tech's own workforce. So we um, tried to really design this project as a worker-centered research effort, um, beginning with one-on-one -on -one conversations. We put out surveys uh, of contract workers. We published working papers, really examining the whole issue. And we put out a summary report a couple of weeks ago, along with a responsible contracting standard um, on how to make improvements in this uh, practice. So I want to thank all the workers who are on this call today and those who aren't, who shared their story, um, both privately and, and publicly, um, and really informed where we went with this project. And through all of this, we started working with a variety of organizations um, who are working in the space, trying to make improvements for workers um, in tech and, and across California and really across the country too. Um, and we started sharing notes and thinking about what can we do together to make improvements here. Um, and so that brings us to this amazing group of people who are joining here today. So we're really, really honored to be joined by four fantastic panelists. And I'm gonna go ahead and let them each introduce themselves. I want to note that, as I said at the top of the call, State Senator Monique Lamont will be joining us um, probably about halfway through this call to talk about a really important piece of legislation she introduced today. But I'm going to go ahead and hand first to Hannah to introduce yourself, and then we'll go through the panelists. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Hannah Holloway. She, her, um, Senior Policy Manager with Tech Equity Collaborative. So uh, I suppose I was lead researcher on our contract worker disparity project. It very much was a labor of love, so many hands involved, but um, I was lucky enough to um, be one of the shepherds of it. Excited to be here. Great. And Christopher, could you introduce yourself? Hello, uh, I'm Christopher Colley. I am he, him, and I'm a data annotator, and I work for Raider Labs, which is contracted by Google to help train algorithms related to search results and to ad placement. I've done this work for various companies since 2015. And I interviewed with Tech Equity last year and I think that their work is super important. And I believe that uh, no worker should be struggling to make ends meet when working for some of these very profitable companies. Thank you for being here, Christopher. We appreciate you. Uh, Dave, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Desario. I'm the director of Temp Worker Justice. We're the national organization for so-called temporary workers. Um, based in Brooklyn, but I used to live in Oakland, and I moved from Oakland to Brooklyn, and my rent went down when I moved to New York City. So I <laughs> don't understand rub it in. Don't rub it in. We're also <laughs> working on housing. Exactly. So just thankful to be included in Tech Equity's work, which has been really amazing in this space, and in being included with these great panelists. Great. And last but certainly not least, Mariko, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Mariko Yoshihara. I'm the policy director and legislative counsel for the California Employment Lawyers Association. We are an association of lawyers who represent workers, and I lead all the legislative and policy efforts um, that our association works on. And we've just done a lot in the space of pay equity, um, discrimination, harassment, as well as really nitty gritty wage and hour issues. So um, happy to be here. Welcome. Well, thank you all for joining. We're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, and I'll uh, set up a series of questions, but feel free, all of you, to hop in if you have things you want to add. Um, Hannah, I'd love to start with you, and I'm hoping you can kind of set the foundation for everyone on the call. Um, as you mentioned, you were the lead researcher on this project at Tech Equity, and you conducted the majority of our first-person worker interviews. You wrote the reports. You wrote the papers. I wonder if you can walk everyone through some of the top-line sort of findings from the project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we were starting from both a place of our work with uh, an organization called Silicon Valley Rising, um, working to organize and create a responsible contracting standard for low wage workers on tech campuses. Um, but also a lot of the media coverage around this phenomenon has really focused on this concept of a two tier workforce within tech. Um, and I guess I'd bullet it out just to say through our interviews and our research that you mentioned, Sam, we found this to be true, this two tiered system in myriad ways. Um, 
First off, the roles filled by contract workers within tech are incredibly vast. As I mentioned, it's uh, service workers, cafeteria workers, um, people working in the campus gyms, but also what we think of as sort of, you know, more typical tech roles. So software developers, data analysts, UX designers, content moderators, um, and in the case where there are sort of these direct comparisons with um, direct tech workers, our findings indicate that it, contract workers are earning less money for the same roles. Um, and then I would also say, as you mentioned, through our surveys, we ran both in-house and a paid survey. Um, we found certain key takeaways that hold across no matter which data site you're looking into. Um, and those are that these workers, contract workers, or as Dave mentioned, temporary workers um, are more likely to be from underrepresented racial and gender groups, and that those disparities are particularly severe for Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and non-binary non contract workers. Um, and that also carries over into the likelihood for conversion, um, despite that being a sort of principally cited reason that contract workers enter into this type of employment, as well as a carrot that's really dangled over workers to, to keep them in the roles, um, conversion to direct employment is incredibly rare. And that we see the same racial disparities in who is actually getting converted, much more likely to convert if you're a white male to direct employment than for the overwhelming majority of who these contract workers actually are demographically. Um, and then, as we've also shared throughout our reporting and other sources that um, the benefits and protections for contract workers are just um, a lot spottier and a lot less reliable than they are for direct workers, despite in this case, working in tech, um, which enjoys a reputation for having great benefits and great protections. Um, but I also kind of want to zoom this out and talk about <laughs> the ways in which this practice structurally harms workers. Um, workers frequently reported to us this dual management structure in which um, their staffing agency is responsible for things like performance reviews, really sort of HR and personnel um, practices, but day to day, the contract workers work with often are cited alongside tech companies. Um, and importantly, decisions about contract renewals are often made by those tech companies. Um, and if your livelihood depends on, you know, the good favor of folks that you're working with um, in order to ensure that you actually have uh, money for rent next month, um, the workers that we spoke with frequently reported that they were unlikely to advocate for themselves in many ways. Um, and that looked like both, you know, advocating for higher wages, but also um, perhaps not reporting workplace safety or even harassment issues. Um, for fear of being labeled as sort of problem colleagues and not having their contracts renewed. Um, and I would just say, I think it's also, sorry, there are so many findings, but if I can take a <laughs> with just a couple more <laughs> minutes, um, I would say for us, this big the question, like why were there so many kind of murky, hard to understand parameters around this type of employment? And when we dug in, we found that it's really best understood through um, this concept of joint employment. Um, this arrangement works for the tech companies, for the parent companies, because the workers are employed by the staffing agencies, but perform the work for the tech clients. Um, companies often like this because it limits their responsibility to those workers. Um, it, you know, runs more easily for them. They can hire and fire and sort of scale up their workforce and scale it down as necessary. But the workers employers in the eyes of the law are the staffing agencies. If that relationship between those three entities, tech company, staffing agency, and worker, starts to look too much like traditional unemployment, um, there is a risk that the tech company could be designated as a joint employer of that worker, um, which would increase their legal liability to them. They could become responsible for things like overtime pay, uh, labor protections, and allow the worker to sue both the staffing agency and the um, employer for damages if it came to that. So they try to avoid that. And the way that they apply that is through um, things like the dual management structure, keeping workers out of all staff meetings, giving them different color badges, not giving them access to company internet systems. Um, and so for the workers, it feels very arbitrary and confusing. Um, but when you understand that standard, it sort of 
helps understand sort of structurally what's happening and why. Um, so I would say this structure, but also the fact that, as I mentioned, there are um, fairly significant gender, racial, ethnic disparities in the workers start to point to um, overwhelming evidence that within tech and other industries that rely on contract work, there's evidence of occupational segregation within the contract workforce. Got it. Paid less tend to be more people of color and women and non-binary folks than what we see in direct employment, which for all of us on this call probably know that tech is uh, stubbornly not moving forward on um, better hiring demographics, no mobility, and a, a dual management structure that ultimately harms workers. Um, and I will just add that uh, harming workers is the thing that triggers joint employment for any tech companies listening in. So the best thing you can do is make sure that workers aren't harmed if you're worried about that. Um, so I wanna actually kick us over, thank you, Hannah, to Chris. Um, you've lived this experience, right? You've been in a variety of contract roles um, with different tech companies. And as a member of, I believe you're a member of the Alphabet Workers Union and so actively trying to help other workers. And I wonder if these findings that Hannah's wrapping down, if they sound relatable to you and your experience and what you see as some of the biggest challenges facing contract workers, um, either for yourself or for other workers that you're supporting? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, pretty much everything that Hannah's mentioned definitely is super relatable, uh, either personally with myself or through my coworkers or through members of Alphabet Your Workers Union. Pretty much everything that has come up in this report is something that uh, I've seen or we've seen. Um, something I would definitely uh, pick out is number one is precarity of workers. Uh, improving conditions would be great, but if you can be fired at any moment, uh, it's not for much. So I think uh, you know everybody would love the stability of working directly for Google, uh, all of my coworkers and myself, but with the current two-tiered workforce that we have, uh, you can be fired at any moment, and that makes a lot of workers very afraid. So mm -hmm. as mentioned, afraid to stand up to talk about working conditions, pay, or any number of things. Um, in regards to pay, uh, a lot of us, we have very low wages, sometimes below $15 an hour. But even those who do make $15 an hour, it's extremely difficult to get by for some of them. Uh, they struggle to pay bills. And some of the workers I know they, especially those with children, they make wages so low that they're uh, eligible for government assistance programs like Medicaid. And a lot of them simply don't get healthcare through their employer. So some of them are on Medicaid. And uh, another important issue mentioned is the, the dual management such as situation where in uh, the situation of myself and my coworkers, there's a firewall between us and the company we're ultimately working for. And that means that sometimes our jobs are harder to do or impossible to do because some of the work we do, we need answers quickly. And that simply isn't possible in the arrangement that we're in. So that means that the work that we do suffers and that the people who our work, our data annotation work is for on the other end at Google, they can't get the work that we're doing because our questions can't be answered because of the firewall between us. Right. So this situation is made to essentially make more profit for Google or some of these other tech companies, but it ends up hurting the workers on both sides of the firewall, both full-time workers at Google and the temp workers and contract workers. So it's beyond the issues of low pay, which aren't acceptable and poor treatment, which isn't acceptable. It's just bad overall for all of the workers. Absolutely. And I think one point you made, Christopher, I want to like hammer on a little bit is you mentioned that there are contractors, you know, that you're familiar with working ostensibly for the parent company of Google that are making less than 15 an hour. But Google has a standard that all their contractors are to be paid 15 an hour. And I think that that uh, juxtaposition highlights how important it is that there's public accountability around what companies are paying contractors and not just that they've made stated commitments, which is a great start, but that there's a way to validate that those commitments are actually translating to better conditions and better pay for the workers. Um, 
So thank you for sharing all of that. One of the things that really stood out to me was when we've talked to, um, you know, different folks, policymakers, press, et cetera, about this issue, they'll often point to, well, some of these workers are making more than 15, right? And really explaining this precarity of if you have a two month contract at even at $30 an hour, but you have no guarantee beyond it, how do you get an apartment lease? How do you sign your kid up for childcare? How do you make commitments to ongoing financial responsibilities when you have no guaranteed employment? So the wage rate, you know, it sounds like some folks are getting paid abysmal wages, especially from an extremely profitable company, but um, the wage rate is not indicative of the full story with contract workers, which I think you've highlighted really well um, in your experience. I just wanted to double down on, um, cause I think a lot of folks miss that. Dave, I wonder, um, you have a wealth of experience, obviously, as the executive director of Temp Worker Justice, and I think it's important anytime that you talk, I try to point out to people, like, you were a temp worker yourself, and you got pissed off, right, <laughs> and you started advocating and figuring out how to make things better and have done an incredible job, you know, building coalitions across the country, introducing federal legislation, putting together a film. I wonder if you could compare the experiences that are being shared by Hannah and by Christopher with what you're seeing um, in contractor and temp worker experiences outside of tech and in other industries. Do they seem similar? What are the things that you're focused on? Yeah, um, tech is one piece of it, but temp and subcontracting is so big, it's really every industry and every occupation. There are some, some differences between uh, work that's out of tech and work that's in tech, but there are really fundamental similarities that everyone shares in these temp out jobs. So just quick, some of the big differences, I mean, the low pay is common, but at least it's not 725 an hour, which a lot of temp workers still make and live in really extreme poverty. Um, and in, uh, there, in certain industries, the risk to life and limb to uh, injury or death on the job is so severe for temp workers, uh, at least twice that of permanent workers. Um, at least we can remove that from the tech piece. But when we look at the similarities, that's what it's really about. Anyone in these jobs has two big things in common. One, they're getting less of the value of their work returned to them. They're getting paid less and they have no benefits. Um, and they have less of a voice in their workplace. When they have a concern, they often don't know, do they take it to the worksite employer? Do they take it to their temp agency? Um, and both kind of want to throw their hands up and not deal with the problem. So it, there's a lot more in common than there is different between a, a temp worker who is a programmer and one who works in a warehouse. I've done temp work in a white collar and a blue collar. And I'd say, you know, it's it, there's a lot more in common than there is different. Absolutely. It's making me think too, I mean, this is a tech example, but folks may have seen there was some reporting, Hannah, you should correct me, I'm trying to remember, maybe six months, nine months ago about um, contract workers at Facebook who were told by their staffing agency that they didn't get a set of paid holidays, if I'm remembering right, that previously were there. And they actually were in a union, they were pushing back, they were asking why, and the staffing agency said, oh, well, Facebook, you know, demanded that. And then it got to the press and Facebook was like, we didn't demand that. And so there's this back and forth sort of to Christopher's point and Hannah's point and what you're raising is, is this dual management structure. It The ones that suffer are the workers, right? Like the even if a company, a parent company is doing the right thing or a staffing agency is doing the right thing, the person in the dark that's getting harmed sometimes in very severe ways is the worker themselves. So um, thank you for sharing that. And I know we've been really fortunate to sort of have a window into your work and the conditions in a lot of industries. And I think you could say some in tech, right? If you include Amazon and some of these other companies are severe and extremely dangerous. So thank you for raising that as a really important point in this conversation. Um, Mariko, I'd love to hand to you. Obviously, you mentioned this some in your intro, but I think I want to underscore um, just the incredible role you've played as a longtime workers' rights advocate here in California. Um, and you've been really the uh, incredible engine behind some really important legislation that set the standard for pay equity across the country. Um, and I wonder if you could share some about sort of, you know, in your role, you have lots of employment lawyers coming to you, right? Saying, here's the issues workers are coming with, here's an opportunity for public policy. I wonder if, share, if you could share some of what you've been hearing about contract work and how it relates to the work you've been doing to fight for equal pay and end racial and gender discrimination in California. 
Yeah, so not surprisingly, our lawyers are hearing a lot of what Christopher and Dave and Hannah were saying, um, just generally what workers are facing with this very precarious work structure. Um, I think where our lawyers come in, because obviously we are trying to help workers enforce their rights. And it's interesting because like as I'm trying to make our laws more robust and give workers more protection, the more we start to see employers by design try to come up with employment structures that could then avoid any sort of liability or accountability to those laws that we have designed to protect workers. So ultimately, I think it is this problem of, of enforcement. And so how that plays out again is, as we've been talking about this fissuring of the workplace, there's a great book called um, The Fissured Workplace, but these continue employers are trying to create these fissures and cracks in our traditional employer employee work relationship, uh, which a lot of our laws really are are structured around that traditional um, work relationship. So we see that with subcontracting, layers and layers of subcontracting, this issue of contract workers using staffing agencies, misclassification. Um, so having workers classified as independent contractors when they are absolutely doing work of employees. Um, so those are some kind of like by design ways to create the precarity and the fissures in those traditional employment relationships that again, operate to prevent the worker from enforcing their rights. And then how also I think that plays into this broader problem of just, and it, it feels a little bit like whack-a-mole, you know, we try to pass this law and then, you know, something else is created where we're actually not able to address that very issue that we just designed a law to address. Um, and really what we want is a way to have the companies you know, have these sort of like comprehensive policies and procedures where they can look at where there are structural inequities and where they can have be accountable to their workers. Because ultimately that is the role of the employer to, you know, to make sure that they are treating their workers fairly, paying them fairly. Um, and then the other thing that I think is just important to note that our lawyers are seeing quite a bit of that relates to this is just more and more oppressive sort of employment terms in the employment agreement, ways that limit a worker from speaking out, from talking with other workers, um, from again, enforcing their rights and a court. Um, so a lot of times workers are forced to go into arbitration. And a lot of these things are being challenged under the National Labor Relations Act because, you know, it really is impinging on this ability to work collectively with other workers. Um, but ultimately, you know, just to the original question, um, I think it's just getting harder and harder um, because by design, I think they're constantly trying to change different employment models to kind of avoid the laws that we're, we're creating to, to, to address these problems. Yeah. And maybe I'm like, I'm looking at time because I'm like, oh, I want to go down that thread because I know Dave has a lot of thoughts about um, a practice that contractors have been using called that they're calling bondage fees, where there's like a conversion uh, assessment on the worker if they convert to full time. So I know we're light on time, but I would encourage people to read the temp worker justice report, as well as our responsible contracting standard, which deals with some of these things that Mariko just raised of how these um, sort of arrangements and employment agreements get even more difficult for workers, right? It's like a constant, like you said, whack-a-mole, right? To try and make sure that things are fair and safe and, and good for workers. So I wanna pivot us a little bit um, towards solutions and some of what folks are working on now. So um, Christopher, I know um, yourself and Alphabet Workers Union has done a lot of work to take on some of the most egregious behavior towards contractors at Google. And I wonder if you could talk about what you're thinking about, what your focus is for improving conditions for contract workers and what priorities you have, what, what's top of mind for you um, of what has to get fixed. Yeah, um, TVC workers, which are temps, vendors, and contractors, 
make up over half of the people who work for Google. And uh, the stuff that uh, we encounter is a very big priority for AWU. Um, an example of things that uh, we face and workers like us face is workers who work for a contracting company called Modis working at Google, one of their data centers, they won back a $200 weekly pandemic uh, attendance bonus that they had been promised through the end of 2021, but which was cut off without explanation. And they're organizing with the help of AWU really uh, won that back for them. And all of the workers got that back. And many of them were earning only $15 an hour. And for a lot of people that simply isn't enough. So the bonus was hugely important. And part of what uh, I'm focused on when others are focused on in AWU is letting other TVC workers know that they have the power to achieve something similar. And part of that is simply letting them know that AWU exists because for a lot of workers, they're very isolated. They have uh, work situations such as uh, mentioned uh, by Mariko with the uh, employment contracts that make it very difficult for them to talk about their work because they're afraid of violating an NDA. So they're afraid to organize. And part of that is say, hey, you can organize. We can have your back and you can stand up for yourself. So part of uh, my work and others is to just let people know that we're out there. We, we can organize together. And uh, part of workers in tech throughout the industry have to realize that they have the power to stand up if they uh, need changes to happen. They're gonna have to do it themselves, a lot of the cases, and hopefully uh, people in other uh, fields, legislative and through nonprofits and programs such as this can really help uh, back them up when they do stand up. Absolutely. I think also it's worth mentioning that, you know, Alphabet Workers Union has been able with workers like you, Christopher, to be out front on these issues because they have a union, right? And most workers, they can't do that. They don't have the luxury of speaking about their experience without facing uh, disciplinary measures, right? And so one of the key benefits of not only making sure workers have a, a voice within the company is that it gives them a voice outside of the company to raise the alarm bell and say, here's what's happening and be able to talk to other folks. So I just wanted to also echo that um, as a real benefit of, you know, what's happening with AWU as well. Um, and thank you for being willing to share with us and, and with our community about your experience. Um, a couple other things on this point um, before we get into legislation is Dave, you know, you recently, um, Oh, I see we have Senator Limon here, actually. Let me pause. Sorry, I didn't see you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Senator, thank you so much for being here. I know you are in session, so we appreciate your time. Um, I want to really make sure we're thoughtful about your time and give you a chance to jump into this really historic piece of legislation you introduced today. But um, before we go there, we have a lot of tech workers on this call and a lot of folks in the Bay Area who may have not met you before. So I wondered if you could share a little bit about your leadership and your fights for women's rights and environmental justice and education and sort of what brought you to public office in California. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. And good to see, to see all of you here. Um, Senator Monique Limon, I represent Ventura and Santa Barbara counties in the state legislature. I served four years in the state assembly, and uh, I am now in my second year in the state senate. Um, first woman of color uh, to be elected from Santa Barbara Ventura counties uh, to the state senate. So certainly have had my own journey, right, in terms of thinking about how one uh, moves forward and how we get there. Um, but I also, you know, spent 14 years in higher ed. So oftentimes, I describe myself as an accidental politician. I didn't know that this is where my life would lead. Certainly did not know that my professional trajectory would lead here. Um, but some of that is also has been really uh, key to how I think about life and policy in, in many ways. And so when this idea and this bill SB 1162 kind of came to me, I thought very often about my 14 years in higher ed and about how I applied for jobs, about how, how I understood when there were promotional opportunities working in higher ed um, and what salary ranges meant for me in terms of going into an interview um, and potentially negotiating what would one would make. So, uh, you know, all of this combined um, has, has been something that I think that has really inspired me. I used to serve on the Women's Commission for Santa 
Santa Barbara County. I'm the former vice chair of the Legislative Women Caucus here in, you know, in our state legislature, um, and, and also served on school boards. And in every single step of the way, and in all of these experiences, I've been very aware, aware um, that I am a woman, that I'm a Latina, um, and that we have got to do more work uh, in order to, to, to make parity across the board, um, not just you know gender, but also racial. Um, and it's hard, right? Because so many of these things are well-intentioned people with systems in place that don't allow us to move um, forward in a way. So it's like, how do you get those barriers and structures out of the way? Or how do you reduce them so that more people can climb over and more people can go over? Um, and certainly following some of the work that legislative women caucus champions have done um, in the past. And so uh, that is how we got here uh, to this particular place, but it's great to be able to connect with you all. Great. Well, we're so happy you're here. And I know our members love um, meeting electeds and getting to hear your story and love being able to share their story with you as well. So um, I'd love to just get into a little bit of the specifics about the bill because we haven't talked about it yet in the call is you introduced um, last night, this morning, the pay, uh, pay Transparency for Pay Equity Act, SB 1162. Um, this would be the first in the country um, type of legislation to really advance pay equity. Um, and we have some of the best laws in the country, and this would be building on them, fixing loopholes, and meeting some of the demands that have come from not only contractors, but workers who are fighting for equal pay for equal work. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about what the legislation would do and um, anything else you want to say about it. Now, absolutely. I think, you know, we have looked at the data and I think not only do we have lived experiences and anecdotes that we can point to, but we've also looked at the data and that we know um, that, you know, after a recent study, we saw that women lost approximately 46 billion women in California lost about $46 billion due to the gender pay gap. And people of color lost about $61 billion due to that gender pay gap. We see the data over and over and over that is evidence that this really is an issue here in the state of California. And so we looked and we tried to identify what are some of the ways where you can close that, right? Um, and so you are looking to, to, to make it a more, a more uh, narrow gap as opposed to a wider gap. And we understand that there's certain elements that have been helpful um, in, in work situations that are very useful. And so um, looking at that, we're looking at the employment process itself from hiring to promotion to ongoing employment. And this law and this bill um, looks at the ways that we can do this. Um, you, you know, I, I think that we're looking to gather more pay data as a requirement um, for our growing workforce. When we passed Senate Bill 973 a few years ago, um, you know, it was limited to who we were collecting this information from. And so, for example, it didn't include um, some of the temporary contract work um, force. And we think that since that is becoming a much bigger workforce in the state, we have to start collecting data. Um, certainly, we expect there's resistance to collecting data, um, but we think that, the, the, you know, if you're a growing workforce, we want to know what's happening in that particular space. So that's one big important element um, of the bill, that it does collect um, this information um, for our temporary workers, um, contract workers as well. Um, additionally, I think that um, we, we see that there are, you know, some companies where their temporary workforce is actually larger than their permanent workforce. And so we've, we are trying to understand um, how we solve for, for some of that and what that means to the overall state of California, to the economy, what it means to women and people of color. Um, then we ask uh, a question that I think you know, in my world, coming from higher ed was very common, especially if you apply to public institutions, you would see salary ranges. Salary right. ranges were just important um, to see because it gave you an understanding of what you're bargaining um, and what you were able uh, to, to ask for when you're applying for a job. And more and more, uh, you know, we, again, continue to have evidence. So all that I'm saying is, is really evidence-based. We're not kind of throwing things, you know, from anywhere. Um, to be able to say we need to see salary ranges um, and salary ranges have been proven to be helpful for women and people of color and so 
we're asking for transparency in that area as well. And so ultimately, the bill does a little bit of everything. We also want to make sure that we don't forget that once you are employed, um, these secret promotions um, are really hard to compete for. Uh, and, and so we want to make sure that employers are already doing this. And what I think is important to recognize is we will, we do expect that there will be opposition um, you know, uh, from folks, but we also think that it's really important to recognize that all three of these elements are already in place with some employers. We're not asking people to do things that's not already out in the workforce. We're asking to replicate best practices in the state. Um, this bill, what this bill does not do is it didn't, is, does not uh, require any company to pay a certain amount of, in, you know, amount or salary. It just asks for transparency, for disclosure, um, and for more, for the ability to collect more data. So we're excited. Um, we think it is very meaningful to the state of California. However, you know, we, we are coming to you in a day of excitement of sharing the news uh, with the state that we're doing this, but also hoping that you learn more about this so you can feel the place where you're all uh, interested and comfortable because this will definitely be um, a bill that will have some opposition. Um, but we think that transparency and disclosure is absolutely helpful um, and, and is the right direction to go, not just for the state. Remember, I've talked a lot about women and people of color. That's not, those are not the only subgroups that will benefit. Everyone benefits from this, but we also know that these subgroups that I've mentioned are the subgroups that tend to have the largest, right, the widest pay gaps um, that we've seen. And so we think it's particularly important um, to call that out. Wonderful. Um, we are so appreciative of your leadership, of your willingness to move this piece of legislation forward, even in the face of what we expect will be opposition. And I think what you shared of this is what many companies, many great companies are already doing. And how do we make this benefit available to all workers in California? Um, we appreciate you. We appreciate your courage in moving that forward and really fighting on behalf of women and people of color in this state. Um, we're just, we're so thrilled to work with you. Um, all of our panelists here on the call are public supporters of the bill. We can't wait to get started. And for those of you that are on that want to know, as Senator Limon said, how to do more, we'll be going over our calls to action and ways you can get engaged throughout um, this legislative session. So thank you, Senator Limon, for your time. I know you have to get back to session, but we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you to everyone for having me. Um, and I look forward to connecting uh, again. Um, and, but thank you all so much uh, for your work. And thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we're at the right time to start with um, Q&A. So I want to invite our director of content, Marianne Wellington, to come in and let us know what's happening in the Q&A, what questions people have. Um, and go ahead. Sweet. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, thank you all so much for, uh, for this amazing conversation. It's been so fun to watch behind the scenes and nod my head fervently at everything you say. <laughs> and thank you again to Senator Limon for joining us. Um, and thank you to all the attendees who've been here for the entire conversation. Um, we have a lot of great questions in the Q&A, so let me just pull them up. Um, we have a question about um, like some of the details about how we split contract work versus full-time work. Um, so how are we like evaluating this, this line and how, um, how broad do we think the issue of contract work versus con uh, full and time employee work is that may not be captured in statistics. So maybe I'll pass this over to, to Hannah. I'm happy to take a stab, but I actually think Dave with your broader industry perspective might have a really great answer and I can jump. I, I'm happy to take it, but I just want to get the best answer. And I think that can come from Dave. Oh. Hannah, you take it because I was typing into a question and I'll admit I didn't hear this question at all. So <laughs> okay. Please you go. Okay. Um, well, one, I would say that the sort of contract versus full time is a little bit of a misnomer. Many of the folks that um, are on temporary or contract um, employment are full time work 40 hours a week, um, just do not have sort of the direct employment relationship with the parent company. Um, and so I think that's a really helpful way to, to think about the distinction between what we call direct hires, people, sort of W-2 employees of parent companies, in this case, tech companies, 
versus people whose employment agreement is with a third party, whether that's a staffing agency or a vendor company. Um, so that's how we think about the distinction, not so much in terms of hours worked, um, but in terms of who the relationship is with between worker and employer. The thing I will add to is, um, you know, Christopher alluded to this uh, in some of his remarks and, and what Hannah shared is that there's a variety of what, you know, if you're looking at, this is like wonk wonk, but if you're looking at sort of tax-based, what type of contracting, there's a wide range, right? So there's W-2 contractors that work for staffing agencies that get hired by a parent company. There's 1099 workers and independent contractors, which is a slightly different thing and has been uh, legislated a lot, all of us know, um, in California. There's also piecework, um, which happens often through informal networks or through a company that's posting, you know, kind of gig and piecework uh, tasks on different sites where workers can take a specific project or a specific task and they get paid by that task. Um, so this, this phenomenon is big, it's wide. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth noting that just on the staffing agency piece of it, which is a place where we spend a lot of time and attention, that industry has grown its revenue share to $144 billion a year, right, Hannah? Um, so it's, it's a mass, yeah. massive industry. Um, so I would just add that. Yeah. I think it's around 120, but still Thank pretty you. Awesome. you know, I round up. I know. <laughs> Great. And obviously with such a, a massive industry um, in light of our pandemic that we've been in for so long, um, we have a, a attendee in the chat asking Chris specifically, how has working from home slash working amidst a pandemic been affecting contract workers at Google? Does it make things harder, easier? Um, the for, for me, I would say there's uh, two things that come to mind. Um, one is uh, an example where uh, COVID tests uh, for testing at home for remote workers who were directly employed by Google, uh, they're provided by Google to have a, a machine, a, an expensive machine that does a rapid at home tests and workers who were contracted or uh, workers like myself on my team, we either received um, uh, nothing whatsoever, no tests, or uh, tests that you would have to mail in and wait a couple of days for a response. And I think that's an issue where if Google values their workers who are directly employed enough to uh, give them tests to make sure that they're safe with their families and in their communities, uh, why shouldn't they be doing that for workers who are contracted in their wider workforce? And that's an example of the impact. Um, another example is when uh, the workers at Google have a day off or uh, such as uh, we had in the pandemic where, where their offices were closed, a lot of the remote workers like myself and the people on my team, we didn't have hours to work and we weren't compensated for the time that uh, we didn't get because uh, of the lack of uh, work for us because people at Google weren't in the offices, which meant that a lot of us were on uh, unemployment for a period where we were working, uh, making far more on unemployment than we had been at our actual jobs. And in, in my view, it shouldn't be that you make more on unemployment when working for Google than you do when actually working on behalf of Google. You're here. Thank you for sharing, appreciate it. Um, okay, I think I have about two more questions. Um, one is, let me pull it up. Um, are policy interventions the only path forward? What can companies do to voluntarily start the process of changing their corporate practice? I, I can try and take that one, um, if it's helpful. So um, when we issued our report, um, which I'm sure Herman, our colleague, has dropped in the chat a couple of times, um, the website for that, there's a summary report that um, Hannah and others uh, on the team put together. There's also within it a responsible contracting standard, which is um, pretty comprehensive and was informed by uh, folks like Temp Worker Justice and Alphabet Workers Union and lots of other ongoing tech worker um, activism to ensure that it's augmenting that work, but gives companies a pretty comprehensive playbook for if they want to do something um, differently if they want to make sure that these sorts of things aren't happening. There are step-by-step -step practice changes they can make um, on pay, on mobility, on um, 
benefits on a wide variety, on the two-tiered structure, on all sorts of pieces. So I would definitely recommend if anyone here is thinking about, you know, you're at a company that, you know, you believe wants to do the right thing, wants to make this better, to share that standard with them. And if there are companies that want to talk about that, we'd love to have a conversation about what you could do voluntarily right now to make things better for contractors without waiting for any legal changes. You have the power to make a massive amount of changes to make this better. I would, I would also add because, you know, we, we were getting a lot of pushback when we originally were trying to pass SB 973, which was the, the original pay data reporting requirement, which was modeled after the federal law. Um, and we actually pointed to good employers who were voluntarily doing pay audits themselves and, and doing it in a way where it was not just comparing you know, person to person, but also kind of looking big picture at structural inequities and, and these companies actually, um, you know, paid, try to rectify those pay inequities and, and do the right thing. And, and ultimately, I think, and this was one of the talking points we used with SB 973, and I think we'll be working, we'll be using with 1162 for employers who want to avoid any potential liability just putting the report together a lot will give them the tool really to see, okay, how, how can we work to make this report look better? Um, Intel actually, they, they published their pay data report and along with that said, okay, here are the things that we're going to do to make sure that we change this. And so, and, and again, that's before requiring that these pay data reports be public. So yeah, there are companies that are that are doing the right thing, um, and yeah, really appreciate those efforts. I I could, also, oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Just two points to bring up on that one. If you're a company that has temps, you got to look at the staffing services agreement with the temp agency. They're overwhelmingly there to protect the temp agency, and that's normal. But we can start there and make things better for workers, and we'd be happy working with Tech Equity. Uh, and your company to figure out what we can do to really formalize how that's better. And also an answer, you know, if you're a union, uh, temps are in a lot of union shops. The collective bargaining agreement can regulate how they're used and it can create a pipeline for those temps to come into the union and to strengthen the union at the end of the day and to really create good jobs. And it is in some places. So there, there's a lot of ways that uh, the law would be great, but even before Senator Limon's law passes in California, employers and unions can take action. Absolutely. The last thing I was gonna say, just I'm, I'm very hyped about this bill, obviously, but <laughs> part of what is amazing about this bill is like Mariko said, you know, um, the pay data reporting and asking companies to report on their workforce is best practice. It's being done in Europe and other places, and it's already the law here in California. What our bill does is makes that public, includes contractors, and includes um, putting the pay in the job description, which is everyone's favorite fix that we need to do. Um, and I believe wholeheartedly that that's also equaling the playing field, because right now you have companies that are doing the right thing. They're disclosing this information to their shareholders they're disclosing it to their boards and you have bad actors that have no accountability, right? Workers have no way of knowing what they're stepping into in some of these companies. And this creates fairness, right? Across the market so that people aren't unfairly, you know, doing the right thing, putting this information out and then being undercut by someone else. Everyone has to put it out. It's fair. It's, you know, pro competition. It's a good thing, I think, for companies. Um, something I would add about uh, transparency is having uh, a, an understanding of how many workers are impacted and how many contractors and temps there are is important because when we're dealing with problems such as pay and uh, no benefits, we need to know how big the ask is when we're organizing around those issues and not even knowing how many people are impacted by it. And obviously these companies aren't going to give that information out unless uh, they're very generous or they're told to, it, it's super important to know how big the problem is so you know how big of your ask is when you try to seek uh, change. Great. Marion, I think maybe one more and then 
Cool. I'd love to do one and a half because I know Mariko is really um, raring to go about the the factors that uh, other factors that lead to the wage gap aside from race and gender. So go yeah, ahead. Yeah, super quick because I I just saw that there were like three other like three questions related to this. Like, are we tracking other um, factors like education, other things that could lead to to the wage gap? And I just want to be clear that um, there is a space for for the companies to report why the data looks the way that it does. So if it is because of education or these other factors, there's a place to provide comments on why that is. And that's actually good because it will make sure that employers are digging in and like, okay, this isn't reflective of what I know the work for it, like these pay discrepancies. So I'm going to dig in and be able to explain. We want companies to be able to do that. And this allows them to do that. So I just wanted to make that point. Awesome. Thanks, Marika. Cool. We have for our final question, we have a very enthusiastic attendee asking, I am a worker. What can I do now? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked, attendee. Um, we are kicking off a campaign right now. Um, first and foremost is we need current and former contract workers who would be willing to share their story. Um, we can there's a variety of ways you can share it, both anonymously with no attribution or fully publicly. We've been doing interviews. Christopher mentioned this. He was interviewed by us about a year ago. Um, we've been doing interviews and allowing people whatever level of privacy and confidentiality they need to ensure their safety and security and employment. Um, and we will continue to do that. But we would love to have former and current contract workers, not just in tech, any contract workers share their story. Um, Senator Limon mentioned, we expect major opposition from the business community on this bill. And one of the things that really helps not only um, elected leaders, but also companies understand what's happening is to hear stories of how this is impacting workers. Um, so please, uh, if you are a contract worker or have ever been, have ever been one, please share your story with us. Um, you can write it out, you can record it, you can, you know, I don't know, draw me a painting, whatever you need to do. Um, we will drop the link in the chat for where you can um, send your story and it'll be in the follow-up email. Additionally, at Tech Equity, along with um, the folks on this call, SELA and Temp Worker Justice and AWU and lots of other organizations, we're going to be um, testifying on this bill. We're going to be asking people to call in and, and voice their support. I want to just echo for tech workers. It's really important that legislators hear from you because they hear from your lobby and they hear from your executives, but they don't always hear from you. Um, so if this is something you believe in, we'll be sending out um, regular updates on ways you can take action, whether that's calling in during a hearing. We're also going to be hosting a lobby day in May. Um, so there will be lots of opportunities to get active on this legislative season. So please um, join our Slack, <laughs> join our uh, tech equity email list, and we will keep you up to date on that. Okay. We're good on questions. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to add anything. I jumped at the action question. I would just add, uh, talk to your coworkers about the problems you're facing and uh, brainstorm on ideas for potential uh, ways to resolve those problems. Talking to one another is very important. Absolutely. And this legislation doesn't just protect temp workers, or tech workers, it's temp and subcontractor workers in every industry and in every occupation in California. So you don't have to work at a tech company to benefit from it. Absolutely. Okay, I see we're getting close on time. I want to thank our panel um, for joining and sharing your experiences and your insights. I wanna thank Senator Limon for joining us. And I wanna thank our um, event host along with us, the KPOR Center for making this possible, not only this event, but this project. Um, and thank you all for joining and for caring about this issue. Um, my final reminder is if you like this content and you like that we exist as an organization and that we're fighting these fights, please join us as a member you can become a member by giving $10 a month or $100 a year. And um, we would love to have you come into this effort and we need your voices. So thank you to everyone for this event and thank you for being here and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye everyone.